Well, two Sundays from today, we'll be getting started in a congregation-wide book study um, of Gentle and Lowly by Dane Orland. Since 2020, Orland has been the senior pastor of Naperville Presbyterian Church, and for 10 years before that, he worked for Crossways Christian Publishing after he picked up his, his PhD. Uh, when I pick a book to study, I often intentionally pick a book that is about a topic or a subject I would not normally be inclined to preach on, because it's a little like inviting a guest preacher to be here for a few months and being exposed to something that is important, but not necessarily in my wheelhouse. And this book is a case of that. And like almost every part of the book, there will be uh, parts I disagree with. Um, here it's going to be issues of balance that I struggle with. I'm going to talk more about that in two weeks. Um, but through the book, Orlin will use a variety of biblical texts to teach us about the love God has for us and his own heart and nature. And he will take as a central text, the verse, I think, as I just said, most of you know, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble. And many of you know that in the King James, they use the word lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, it, it's important to look at those key words because we tend to use them differently in our culture. When we refer to the heart of a person, we tend to see that as the seat of their emotions, especially positive or loving emotions. That's not how the Bible uses the term heart. Let me quote Orland here. It says, one thing to get straight right from the start is that when the Bible speaks of the heart, whether Old Testament or New, it is not speaking of our emotional life only, but of this central animating center of all we do. It's what gets us out of bed in the morning and what we daydream about as we drift off to sleep. It is our motivational headquarters. The heart in biblical terms is not a part of who we are, but the center of who we are. Our heart is what defines and directs us. That is why Solomon tells us to keep the heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. The heart is a matter of life. It is what makes us the human being each of us is. The heart drives all we do. It is who we are. Two other key words are almost synonyms, gentle and humble. Again, as I just mentioned, many of you know the KGV version here where the word lowly is used. The Greek word translated gentle occurs here only three other times in the New Testament. Uh, in the first beatitude, uh, we usually know that the meek will inherit the earth. But it's the same word for lowly or humble. Uh, in the prophecy of Matthew 21, quoting Zechariah, of Jesus as king coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey. And, and one you just maybe have learned in Peter's encouragement to wives to nurture more than anything else the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. The meaning of lowly overlaps with gentle, a communicating a single reality about God's heart. This specific word lowly is generally translated humble, like in James 4, 6, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Typically throughout the New Testament, this Greek word refers not to humility as a virtue, but humility in a sense of destitution or being thrust down by life's circumstance, which is how the Greek word is generally used throughout Greek versions of the Old Testament, especially the Psalms. In Mary's song, While Pregnant with Jesus, for example, the word is used to speak of the way God exalts those who are of humble estate. Paul uses the word when he tells us not to be haughty, but to associate with the lowly, the humble referring to the socially unimpressive, those who are not the life of the party, but rather cause the host to cringe when they show up. The point is saying that Jesus is lowly is that he's accessible. For all his resplendent glory and dazzling holiness, his supreme uniqueness and otherness, no one in human history has ever been more approachable than Jesus. No prerequisites, no hoops to jump through. The old Presbyterian scholar Warfield, commenting on Matthew 11, 9, wrote, No impression was left by his life manifestation more deeply imprinted 
upon the conscience of his followers than that of a noble humility of his bearing. Verse 28 of Matthew 11 tells us explicitly who qualifies for the fellowship that Jesus offers. All you who labor and are heavy laden. You don't need to unburden or collect yourself when you come to Jesus. Your very burden is what qualifies you to come. And I love this line. No payment is required, he says. I will give you rest. His rest is a gift, not a transaction. Commenting on the book, Justin Peru writes, Every time Jesus encounters a person in the Gospels, every time he encounters a person who is aware of his or her own need, who understands that he or she is sick, unrighteous, has no merit, and are desperate, every time he encounters such a person, he greets them and meets them with compassion, gentleness, tenderness, and he forgives their sin. That's the guy we're talking about today. And we will talk about it in this book. And I think it's helpful to get to know the author of a book we're going to study for, for, for 10 weeks. So I'm going to do something a little unusual. I'm going to show you a 15-minute interview of, uh, of an interview with Dane Orland did about four years ago. Uh, it was actually two years before the book was written and published. Um, I'm kind of glad I'm doing it because I wouldn't have the voice to do this without it. I can give you a great insight into what he was mulling over in his head as he prepared to write this book. And I think it will help you as you read through the book. So hope you, uh, hope you got as, will get as much out of this as I got. But what I love about Dane is he is a passionate, thoughtful uh, theologian, uh, an experiential theologian. Mm -hmm. And while we were here uh, talking and, and hanging out in South Africa, uh, he began to share with me something that you're writing, right? right? And so I, I, I wanted to hear you unpack more of it because mm -hmm. I'm very interested in this and I know our listeners are gonna be interested in it. So mm -hmm. you are right now working on a book about Jesus, but you're hitting something that is neglected today. Right. Yeah, it's been simmering with me, Joe, for probably seven years, um, ever since reading a, a little obscure book by someone who's been dead for about 350 years, Thomas Goodwin, The Heart of Christ. So, uh, yeah, it's a book on Jesus' own heart, uh, not his theology so much, not uh, who he ate lunch with, uh, not how he fulfilled the Old Testament, all things we learn a lot about yeah. in the Gospels. Um, but actually, what is his deepest heart for sinners and sufferers? This sounds, this sounds kind of feely, kind of touchy-feely. I'm mean, a very touchy-feely kind you, of guy. You, you, you give off the vibe of the least touchy-feely guy on this trip. That's why I need this. <laughs> um, this book, because I'm telling you, like, so let me just ask you this. Are you, are you anticipating pushback at all because of this, this sort of approach to the heart of Jesus? Or are you expecting, because like, I'm excited for it, I think it's gonna be amazing. Well, how, I mean, yes, yeah. some people are not gonna like it. But why, what, what's, um, what's the pushback? Um, I think we, we, for some reason, we just feel safer with a domesticated, doctrinally tight, mm -hmm. uh, and only doctrinally tight, uh, Jesus. But he was a person. Right. Uh, my dad pointed out to me something that Spurgeon pointed out to him that in, in uh, uh, the four Gospels, there's only one place where Jesus himself opens up and tells us about his heart. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Oh, yeah. So we learn lots about Jesus and his uh, teaching and disciples and ministry and mission, but in only one place, as I say, now I'm going to tell you in my own words, him setting the terms, uh, what his own heart is. And in that one place, he says, I am not austere and demanding in heart. He doesn't even say something like, uh, I am loving and joyful in heart, yeah. though that's true. The one place he opens his chest cavity up, he says, what you see is gentle and lowly in heart. So that is an astonishing claim. And I just want to reflect on that in a book. So that's what the whole book is on, the, the gentle and lowly heart of Christ? That's it. Um, I want to expand out from that sure. text and not only Jesus, but in fact, the character of God. The prophets in the Old Testament are mm. some of, these are the doom and gloom guys in the right. Bible, but they are some of the mushiest right. guys about this uh, very theme. So why, I think I know what you're going to say. Mm. Um, why is this <clears throat> needed? What is the danger yeah. of us not understanding yeah. the low, 
uh, and tender heart of Jesus. Yeah, I think I, I celebrate the gospel resurgence that we are enjoying today. Um, yeah, there are so many wonderful signs and manifestations of that. I needed it myself. Uh, something broke open in me in the summer of 2008 to see that the Bible tells me I need the gospel today and tomorrow, not just yesterday at right. conversion, uh, that it is my oxygen. Um, and I love that. But that's an objective reality. That's a black and white um, justification mm -hmm. of the gospel of grace. You're completely forgiven. Uh, that's glorious. But it's objective. There's a subjective side. There's a, uh, an affectional side to the gospel that penetrates not just into what Jesus did, but actually who he is, what comes pouring out of him most naturally. That's what I want to talk about. Okay. So when, when I think about, like, because you're, you're, you're really, in, in addressing this issue, you want to reform uh, some of us in our view of Jesus yeah. and how we relate to him. Because, uh, I mean, how we understand his heart is going to have an impact, right, in how we approach him. I, and I just think that like in, in, in the way that I sometimes right. think of Jesus is uh, just kind of frowning and shaking his head at yeah. me like I'm a dummy. Yeah. Just like, what a dummy. Yeah. Look, at the, look at this dumb guy. Like he's doing it again. Yeah. And that's, that's really not how he interacts with sinners. No. He, he, if he does interact that way, it's usually with teachers in positions of, of, uh, of authority who are yeah. abusing other people. Yeah. It's with the impenitent. Yeah. But with the penitent, with the reduced, mm -hmm. with the... Uh, broken right. with the hollowed out with the those who have just torpedoed their life and they know it and they're just looking for some help and answer and life um, he is I, I'm exactly the same way as you brother I roll out of bed and what I am thinking in this little mental universe is another day where I'm going to fall short God is disappointed with me discouraged right. with me frustrated with me he loves me yeah I'm totally forgiven but he's, he's actually kind of thinking, you know, when are you going to get it together? You're the dumb kid that never gets it right. Like, that's how we feel. Like, yeah. it, it, we shouldn't feel that way. Yeah, yeah and we, will, we are um, endless, endlessly resourceful in our internal manufacturing of reasons uh, for God to feel that way toward us. Mm -hmm. And Jesus comes to us and looks us in the eye, and he says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. In other words, you're never going to find someone more accessible mm. and more understanding. He is the most approachable person in the universe. The, the exalted one right. is the, the, gentle and lowly. The sustainer of the universe. Right. See, that, that, that is, that's trippy because you know, we, don't, we don't do well with paradoxes and apparent contradictions and things that are contra. Like, we, yeah. like how can you know, God be sovereign and man be responsible? Yeah. Uh, how can Jesus be holy? Uh, eternal and unchangeable and yet be the most approachable. I mean, that's a powerful statement that, mm. that the Son of God is the most approachable being yeah. um, in the universe. Maybe you could uh, explain this, like what is really at the bottom of that idea that Jesus is, um, has, is lowly in heart? Like what's, mm -hmm. what's really at the bottom of that, that concept? What's yeah. he saying fundamentally? Yeah, when he says he's gentle, and lowly in heart. Some versions will say gentle and humble in heart. Right. It's a Greek word. It's the same word elsewhere in the New Testament that occurs in virtueless for humility. Okay. So I think, what in the world does Jesus have to be humble about? Right. He has every, every reason not to be humble. Well, while being perfect as the Son of God, what, what uh, Jesus is saying about himself is, um, I am in complete solidarity with, with de the distraught, sinners and sufferers. Um, I am not holding you at arm's length. I am not, you know, think of a little six-year-old kid touching a slug for the first time. Kind of reaches out and, and barely touches it and mm. screws his face up and then retracts right away. That's how we think of Jesus. Right. And he's saying in that statement, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, the opposite. What he's saying is that is the photo negative of actually my heart. Uh, I, this is what I love. His heart, not just how he conducts himself, yeah. but if you pierce his heart, which in the Bible, as you know, doesn't just mean your emotional life, but right. your animating center. Right. What gets you out of bed in the morning? What gets him out of bed in the morning, so to speak, is to be in solidarity 
with his distraught people. Mm. That is the first thing that comes out of him, that bubbles up within him, that pours out of him most naturally. This, this would be relevant to, I mean, if we're talking about the heart of Jesus and not just what he does, and of course, you, we, you can't separate those two uh, in, in God, it, but yet we, we do. Like, I'll do the right thing, but I ain't feeling it. You know, I mean, like, we'll say the right thing, yeah. and we'll be, oh, I won't be polite, you'll be polite, and you'll say the right thing, but you might not be feeling it on the inside. Yeah. Whereas when Jesus does what is right, he always does what is right in accordance mm-hmm. with his nature, he is feeling it. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm right. just as you're talking about it, I'm thinking about people not only who are struggling with guilt yeah. and struggling with um, a, a sense of unworthiness, but I'm also thinking about people who have suffered, mm-hmm. you know, uh, suffered trauma mm-hmm. and sexual abuse, to know that in their brokenness, like mm-hmm. Jesus legitimately cares, yeah. that, he, that there is affection in God's heart for them that yeah. is compassionate. Yeah. Um, that is healing. If, I mean, what could be more healing no, than, right. than that sort of intimacy yeah. with your maker? Yeah, completely holy. Um, exalted, um, infinitely dignified, existing eternally, is the one who, according to Hebrews 5, 2, talking about the priesthood and then applying it to Christ, is the one who can deal gently with the wayward and the ignorant. So he, he, he nuzzles up to us, and without, nothing, nothing uh, doctrinally soft here, he, he gets uh, down with us right. in our actual experience mm-hmm. and puts his arm around us and actually buries us into his heart. He hugs us into his, the very internal recesses right. of his heart. That's what he does. He doesn't just uh, come alongside us and forgive us. He does that. He's not here for a job. No. And, th- and this is what I love because, you know, uh, for the past, what, 20 seven years I've been reading Reformed Theology mm-hmm. and when we, when we write and read on the Incarnation, it's yeah. about all this uh, Jesus condescending and becoming one of us and yeah. walking with us, but, y- but this takes it to another level yeah. because it's not just a willful identifying with. There is, I mean, I don't want to say emotional, that's a new word, yeah. uh, it's a modern word, but there is real affection in yeah. the person of Jesus for his people. Yeah. Uh, y- you should write. You should write a book on this. <laughs> this <laughs> is. <laughs> I am so excited about this. So, as 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 our people are are kind of um, thinking through this, right? As I'm thinking through this, what are some passages of scripture mm. that are are, are going to be key for us? Obviously, oh. Matthew 11. For are there, sure. Are there any others that you would say these are some passages that I want you guys to meditate on before you buy my book when it's gonna, whenever it comes out? Yep, there are some pillar passages. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Yeah. The key. Um, revelation yep. in the entire Old Testament of God's character. Repeated a, a, a number of places. Picked right? up throughout the past. Mm-hmm. And um, actually it's disproportionate. Mm-hmm. God is simple. By that we mean yeah. every one of his attributes he has fully. Right. He's not a pie with sections exactly. of attributes. So we don't want to threaten that vital doctrine. But he, it, when he sets the terms and he tells us, mm-hmm. not us creating him in our image, but he tells us who he is. Um, Exodus 34, it's love, and I will yes, be justice, but mercy. Uh, Jeremiah 30 to 33, scholars call it the book of consolation. You got a lot of angry judgment in the first 29 chapters, a lot of angry judgment in the last half of the book, okay. but this island, Jeremiah 30 to 33, it's unreal, Joe. Mm. Um, I yearn for you with my, the Hebrew word is bowels. Wow, yeah. Uh, the kidneys, deepest part. Heart, yeah. yeah. Um, statements like this, I have loved you with an everlasting love. After 29 chapters of <laughs> telling them their record, yeah. which is not good. Uh, Hosea 11. Mm. Um, Matthew 11 for sure. Hebrews, Goodwin's book, The Heart of Christ, was written on Hebrews 4.15. Okay. That Christ was made like us in every respect except sin, so he can sympathize with right. us. Um, Hebrews 5.2 uh, Ephesians 2, 7, what is the point of everything? Mm-hmm. The point of everything is to display the loving heart of Christ in eternity forevermore, and thereby is God glorified. Wow. Those are a few. Um, and then what could we read on this? I mean, like nobody's writing on it today, yeah. but some people have written on it in the past. Yeah. So what are some classic resources, maybe two 
classic resources that you would say, hey, find yeah. this online or pick it up at, uh, at a bookstore or yeah. Amazon. Yeah. What, what's out there that they should read? Uh, not Rob Bell. Because <laughs> you think? W w one reason um, I'm so uh, anxious for us to have a book like this, Joe, is um, we, I think, are, can be nervous about being heard and clumped in with that kind sure. of theology when we talk in effusive ways. Right about the love of God. But the Puritans weren't afraid of that. That's right. So good one, the heart of Christ, that's one. It's pretty stodgy, pr pretty analytical. But, uh, so you have to mine hard, but you will find gold. Uh, good one, the heart of Christ, a fuller title was, the heart of Christ who is in heaven for sinners who are on earth. Wow. Um, uh, Jeremiah Burroughs, a good one, Richard Sibbs. Okay, yeah. Richard Sibbs, Bruce the bruised reed. Yeah. He's saying, look, it's the same basic message. Jesus deals with us tenderly. Mm -hmm. uh, go to him. His arms are open. Have you read William uh, Bridge, uh, An Uplifting for the Downcast? Yes, I have. Yeah, yes. Yeah, uh, that, Beautiful. That was a really helpful book yeah. for me, uh, along with Sibs. And, yeah. you know, like, as, this is, this is medicine for every soul, mm -hmm. right? Um, but, it, you know, what comes to mind for me a lot are people who are anxious and people who are depressed, mm -hmm. um, not just clinically so, I mean, just, you know, in, in, in various ways. Um, over, you know, consciences that are burdened or yeah. over lives that are difficult and fraught with difficulty. Um, but it's medicine that we all need in, in various ways. Yeah. When can we expect to maybe see something about this book? Oh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just starting to get everything that's in my mind and heart down. So it'll be a few years before. Oh, seriously? <laughs> what are we doing with the podcast for? It'll be three years? Jesus will be come, coming back before then. We're gonna have, oh my gosh, we wasted our does. time. Yeah, sorry everybody. Uh, you're going to have to just hold your breath for, uh, for the book that's never going to come. You've got the Puritans in the meantime. All right. <laughs> um, kind of interesting to have that voice uh, available in your head as you go and, and read the words now that, uh, that he did actually write and publish. Um, and I do think there's going to be something here for everyone. Um, I love how he describes this book in his foreword, and, and I want to end with that this morning. He says, this book is written for the discouraged, the frustrated, the weary, the disenchanted, the cynical, the empty, those running on fumes, those Christians uh, who, those whose Christians feel like they are constantly running up a descending escalator, those of us who find ourselves thinking, how can I mess up again this bad? Uh, it is for the increasing suspicious, the uh, I'm sorry, it is for that increasing suspicion that God's patience with us is wearing thin. For those of us who know God loves us, but suspect we have deeply disappointed him, who have told others of the love of Christ, yet wonder, as for us, if he harbors mild resentment, who wonder if we have shipwrecked our lives beyond what can be repaired, who are convinced that we have permanently diminished our usefulness to the Lord, who have been swept off our feet by perplexing pain and are wondering how we can keep living under such numbing darkness, who look at our lives and know how to interpret the data only by concluding that God is fundamentally disengaged. It is written, in other words, for normal Christians. In short, it is about sinners and sufferers. How does Jesus feel about them? And I hope you will learn how Jesus really feels about you as you take on his yoke. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, for the wondrous things we're going to be learning about how deep and how wide and how wonderful not just your love for us is, but how very humble and, and gentle your very nature is. And the more we know about you and about how you f work on the inside and about how you feel about us, the more we can come to you and, and, and be healed by you. Pray, Lord, that you will open our hearts and minds in this time. We do pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. But now receive the benediction. Go forward, friends, out into the world knowing one thing, that you are loved. And may God's grace, mercy, peace, and presence, and his love be with you forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.